Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Continuing on with my series of weapon tournament videos, today we're doing a deep dive on all 19 straight swords to finally figure out the top 5 best straight swords in the entire game, so that you can put this information to good use and become an absolute powerhouse in preparation for the DLC. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you know when future episodes come out, along with much more entertaining and informative gaming content. As always, this tournament will be round based and in round 1 we'll be looking at the attack rating. Let's start off with the regular smithing stone weapons and eliminate some very straightforward crappy options. There are many regular straight swords we can get rid of straight off the bat because unlike some other weapon categories, only one of these weapons has anything unique about it whatsoever. That is the Warhawk's Talon. Both its one-handed and two-handed heavy attacks are a quick double swipe and that is quite literally the only unique weapon out of all of the regular smithing stone weapons. So we'll automatically put that straight through to the next round, as it's the only one with anything special about it. Now let's take a look at the attack rating for the rest of them. I will probably only choose two more to put through, because aside from the attack rating, most of the standard straight swords really are very, very boring. So straight away, we can eliminate all of the following. The short sword, the weathered straight sword, the Noble's Slender Sword and the Cane Sword. All four of these are just worse versions of the remaining three that we'll review now. And that leaves us with the Long Sword, the Lord Sworn's Straight Sword and the Broad Sword. The Broad Sword is another one I'm going to put through along with the Warhawk's Talon as this has got the best combined attack rating of all the regular Smithing Stone Straight Swords. Now, of the remaining two, both the Longsword and the Lord Sworn's Straight Sword, on the surface, it does appear as though the Lord Sworn's is better. However, this is only applicable in the early game, as the standard Longsword actually has far better scaling, especially when you apply any affinities to it, particularly Flame Art, Sacred, or Magic. Therefore, in the late game, because the Longsword has that significantly better scaling, it also does far more damage when your stats start to get into the 50 plus. So, for that reason, going through to round two from the regular category, we have got the Longsword, the Broadsword, and the Warhawk's Talon. Now, let's take a look at the Somber Weapons and put them through round one. We will review these in a more overall capacity, though, as they are so very unique from one another. You cannot purely just look at the attack rating. Two swords that are very obvious to bundle together are the Lazuli Glintstone Sword and the Karia Knight Sword, because both of them have the same unique heavy attack. This attack will block as you're charging before finishing with a powerful slash. And despite how the animation looks, even when you are wielding a shield in your left hand, it doesn't utilize the block stats of your shield, only the stats of the weapon itself. As I say, both the Lazuli Sword and the Karia Knight Sword use this attack. And as you can see, the heavy attack on both of these swords is very powerful, because additionally to blocking, literally any attack that hits you whilst you are charging this will never ever put you into a stun unless the move that you have blocked would completely drain your stamina. So though it isn't particularly flashy or jazzy, it is very powerful. Aside from the charged heavy attack, they do both have a very different weapon skill to each other. The Lazuli Glintstone Sword will shoot out a Glintstone Pebble, and then if you follow up with a heavy attack, you'll thrust forward and do another attack, which is quick and very powerful in certain situations. But the Karian Knight Sword does have this absolutely massive magical sword that you can charge up to a maximum of three times to release a devastating blow. On top of that, when you actually look at the attack rating and the scaling, the Lazuli Glintstone Sword technically is better with a pure intellect build, and I'm talking like 60 to 80 intellect above, it will outscale the Karia Knight Sword. However, in literally all other instances, the Karia Knight Sword is going to have better attack rating. It's also easier to get, and I personally think the weapon skill is better. So for that reason, we will eliminate the Lazuli Sword, and we'll put through the Karia Knight Sword. Now, let's put the rest of the Somber Weapons in attack rating order, based on having between 50 to 55 in all stats, and see what we're working with. And just to clarify that, the reason I have just gone for a blanket 50 to 55 in all stats is to make this as fair and unbiased as possible. 
it means absolutely none of the weapons are working to the absolute best of their ability but also none of them are completely underperforming it's a very good base to have when doing testing like this so straight up one of the massive outliers at only a combined total of 484 attack rating is the ornamental straight sword however we will revisit this outlier at the end of this round because there is a very specific reason that its attack rating is so bad next we have the coded sword this is barely any more powerful than the ornamental straight sword and it doesn't really have any excuse for being this bad don't get me wrong in certain situations the unblockable blade comes in very clutch because as the weapon skill suggests it will completely negate blocking even from great shields so it can do great amounts of damage to very certain enemies but when you're talking about damage output and trying to deal with the likes of the fire giant or the elden beast it is truly a terrible weapon so apart from that one specific thing there is really no reason to pick this sword over any of the others on this list so for that reason the coded sword is out Next up, we've got the Sword of Saint Trina, which has significantly more attack rating than the Coded Sword, but still isn't great. However, it's the only weapon in the game with inherent sleep buildup. And no, before you say it, of course torches don't bloody count. It's a torch. It's awful. You cannot count torches just because it does a little bit of sleep buildup. So, as I was saying, being the only weapon in the game with inherent sleep buildup and a pretty great ash of war, it does have a significant advantage over most other weapons. So we can forgive it for its lack of attack rating and put it through to the next round. Next up is the Mikulin Knight's Sword. Now we're starting to get into a really decent amount of attack rating for these weapons. And it is one of the few straight swords with a unique attack move. This sword has a unique charged heavy attack that lunges forward and you can follow up with either a heavy or a light attack for two slightly different combos as well. It is a great weapon when two-handed, however all of this doesn't make up for the fact that it is still a very mid weapon. It doesn't have a great weapon skill and its attack rating is still on the low end, therefore we will be eliminating this. Next up, we'll take a look at both of the Crystal Swords, the Standard Crystal Sword and the Rotten. Both have really good attack ratings, but both are very boring, considering that they are Somberstone weapons. They have a super basic weapon skill, just like the Mikulin Knight Sword, but the Rotten version does have a little bit of a redeeming quality in the fact that Rotten weapons are very rare in this game. So we will eliminate the standard crystal sword but put through the rotten crystal sword because having that scarlet rot build up is a very unique and sometimes very powerful perk. Next is the regalia. Its weapon skill is great. Situational as it's quite slow but amazingly fun and pretty powerful. However, if you are just using this sword for its weapon skill, then use the Moray Executioner's Sword instead. Just looking at the weapon skill, the Moray Executioner's Sword does it so much better because it is so much stronger. Also, the Regalia primarily scales with Arcane, the only straight sword that does, and one of very few weapons in total that do, which makes it super niche for most builds. Therefore, it's another mid weapon that seems better than it is until you start to dig deeper and it is eliminated. Next up, we have got the Golden Epitaph, the third highest attack rating of any straight sword, decently low stat requirements, and one of the few weapons in the game that prevents the undead from reviving. Add to this the fact that it has a plus 30% damage increase innately when fighting the undead, increasing up to around 45% when you use its very stylish Ash of War. This can be a super powerful weapon, therefore it does move into round 2. Second last, we have got the most powerful straight sword in terms of attack rating and probably in terms of weapon skills as well. Of course, I'm talking about the Sword of Night and Flame. I won't beat around the bush and try and pretend that this weapon is anything other than amazing. What's not to like? It's quite possibly the only weapon in the game with three damage types inherently. It has the best attack rating of any straight sword, one of the most powerful weapon skills in the game, and we could safely say right now that this is moving straight through to the finals into the top five. Finally, let's talk about the ornamental straight sword. It's hard to review this in this category, because for anyone that doesn't know, this is actually far more similar to fists or claws than other straight swords. When you power stance it, it will actually split in two and have a completely unique moveset. This is why its attack rating is so low, because especially when you use its weapon skill, it attacks ridiculously fast. 
Using golden tempering and then holding down your charged heavy attack will make it attack so many times so rapidly. And with consecutive attack buffs, such as the Rotten Winged Insignia and Millicent's Prosthesis, along with something like the Thorny Cracked Tear or items that buff the damage of your charged heavy attacks like Axe Talisman and the Spiky Cracked Tear, you can get some insane damage numbers from this weapon. Therefore, it is also going through to the next round. After round one, let's review the nine weapons that survived so we know what we're working with. For regular smithing stone weapons, we have got the longsword, the broadsword, and the warhawk's talon. And for somber weapons is the Karian knight's sword, the rotten crystal sword, the ornamental straight sword, golden epitaph, sword of Saint Trina, and the sword of night and flame. Now, on to round two. In this round, let's have a look at overall viability for the late game. So it makes sense to look at the smithing stone weapons first and pick the best of the bunch. Unfortunately, despite the fact that it does have its own unique move, the Warhawk Talon just doesn't have the damage to keep up with the broadsword and the longsword. So these are the two we'll be taking a look at. And as I already mentioned about the longsword, because it does have the best scaling out of all of the regular smithing stone weapons, the late game viability is far superior. It offers really great elemental damage scaling with the likes of flame art, sacred or magic infusions, and even offers really good strength scaling with the occult infusion. Late game, when you're starting to get into them big damage numbers, if you want a straight sword with a customizable Ash of War, there is no better than the longsword. And ironically, it is the starting equipment for the Vagabond class. So if you're a proper purist, it is very viable to use the Vagabond class and complete the game with just this weapon. So with the other two eliminated, let's take a look at the six remaining Somber weapons and ideally eliminate two of them so that we're down to a top five. Straight away, I know one that I want to eliminate. It has a super rare passive effect and that is the Scarlet Rot. But the fact that the Rotten Crystal Sword literally just has a really basic weapon skill and has far from the best attack rating, there are no other redeeming qualities for this sword. It is very subpar and the third weapon to be eliminated in round two. That still leaves us with five very, very good swords for this round. And it's going to be insanely difficult choosing what to put where and what to potentially eliminate. We can take a look at the Sword of St. Trina, for instance. It is quite niche. It really doesn't have the damage that you need to carry you through that late game. But the viability that it does have when you need sleep makes it so good in certain situations. After reviewing them, I think the next one to be eliminated will actually be the Ornamental Straight Sword. Its potential damage output is incredible, but comparing it to the weapons that it is most similar to, just like with the Cypher Parter, it leaves you very vulnerable when you're trying to make the most of it. This weapon is only really viable with enemies that have really big attacks with very long cooldowns. If you're going against something a bit quicker, they will almost always stagger you out of your moveset, and you'll be nowhere near reaching the full damage potential of this weapon. With that, we now have our top five, so let's talk about them more in depth and rate them and rank them from worst to best. Just to recap, we have got the Sword of Saint Trina, the Karian Knight Sword, the Long Sword, the Sword of Night and Flame, and the Golden Epitaph. Going into this final round, I'm already extremely certain about the top two, but ordering the other three is very hard because they are all extremely situational. So, going through and thinking about how many situations each of these swords are viable in, I have ordered them as follows. In 5th position, we have got the Golden Epitaph. One of the best attack rating swords and an absolute powerhouse against anything undead. However, being that 50% of its damage comes from holy, many late game enemies are extremely resistant to holy damage, so this drops off significantly late game. It is really only viable as a mid game weapon but it still earns itself a respectable fifth position. Fourth place was even harder to decide. And again, I just had to look at exactly how situational these swords are. So fourth place is the Sword of St. Trina. For enemies that can be slept for long periods of time, this is a godsend. Being able to consistently sleep things and not have to worry about running out of materials, be it soporific grease or sleep pots or arrows is amazing. It's a very fun weapon to use, easy to grab, and something that again can carry you through quite a lot of the early game because you can literally grab this weapon from the start of the game. 
it can really help with some early to mid game areas and comes in clutch with certain boss fights as well but it just doesn't have the attack rating to hold up with the top three next is the carrier knight sword the reason i put this and the golden epitaph this way round is because it relies on magic damage instead there are far fewer enemies that are resistant to magic damage so it's more versatile and is more viable late game especially because of the fact that its weapon skill, Karin Grandeur, is very, very powerful if you can fully charge it. Also, as we mentioned, charging its heavy attack, blocking every single attack before countering with a powerful slash of your own is not to be underestimated. And this is a very fun, very underutilized sword. Now for the top two, of course, as soon as I reveal what's in second, you will know what's first. So let's skip straight to the winner and come back to number two. I think you all knew from the very start of the video, but of course the best straight sword in the game is the Sword of Night and Flame. There is nothing bad to say about this weapon, and for anyone who hasn't been around since the very first Elden Ring patch, up until I think it was patch 1.02, this sword used to be even more powerful than it is now. It was absolutely ridiculous how much damage both of its weapon skills did. Both the Night Comet sorcery from the Night part of the stance and the Burst of Flames from the Flame part of the stance are devastating in so many situations. Enemies that are weak to fire are going to melt to your flames, especially bosses like the Tree Spirits and Erd Tree Avatars. And as long as your opponents are standing still, anything that gets caught in the blast of the Night Comet is going to get absolutely melted. On top of that, this has the best attack rating out of any straight sword. So even if you're just using it to hit enemies normally, it is still going to do disgusting amounts of damage. I could talk about this sword forever. It very well deserves first place. But let's not forget about the long sword. The standard long sword has made it into second position of every single straight sword in the game. And that is because it has the versatility and viability of pretty much every other weapon we've discussed. Being the fact that it's a standard smithing stone weapon means it can be affected with buffs, it can be affected with magic, with consumables, you can apply and infuse any Ash of War you want, you can apply any affinity you want, and being such an all-rounder, such a jack of all trades, it means it will fit into practically any build with insanely low stat requirements and a really respectable scaling and attack rating. It is such an all-rounder sword to apply to any build you want and really help round off your character. So the next time you start another run, maybe you'll look past the Samurai and the Prisoner classes and maybe start with a Vagabond because they start with the second best straight sword in the game. And with that, my friends, all that I have left to say is thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.